So I'm going to break this talk up into four parts. I'll have a brief introduction. And then what I do want to do is talk about the three platform research programs we have ongoing at the foundation. That would be our grants program, the consortium, and the ADPKD registry. And what I'd like to do is, you know, as Wendy said, to facilitate some discussion, I'll at least have a chance to stop after each of those programming updates. We'll try to address what questions we can in the chat and whatever feedback you can provide in the chat. And what we don't get to live today, we'll be able to get to uh, hopefully following up offline. And so when I joined the foundation, the remit for Mandy was to set a clear vision strategy and long-term objectives for research programming. And so what I want to share on this slide is where we are in that, in that process. And so from a vision perspective, it's really, you know, to lead and drive research to the benefit of patients. So think of it as patient-centered innovation. From a strategy perspective, what we've been doing, what we'll continue to do, is really to go out and do assessments of what disease-modifying treatments or approaches are out there take a really close look in terms of how those potentially align with our, with our current platforms, the future pro platforms, and use that to identify, you know, what programming we want to take forward and, 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 and work on. And so that really leads into these three long-term objectives. The first one is for, the, for our registry to be to develop it into the primary outcomes research tool for ADPKD. You know, secondarily, and really, you know, why we're here is today is, we want to we want to be a co-leader in the facilitating the development of drug development tools for the PKD pipeline. And when I say PKD, I mean both ADPKD and ARPKD. And then finally, you know, in concert with with the research program, is going to talk about as well as some other ongoing efforts at the foundation. I'll touch on want to really drive the development and adoption of data driven patient care guidelines. And so, with those as our long term objectives, that really distills down to the three research programs that I'll talk about on this slide, and that is the grants program, the consortium, and the, and the registry. And you can see that from a, from a research perspective, these are really distributed along the continuum of how research can benefit patients. And also what I like about this, how we think about this is really from a portfolio perspective. And so this gives us a portfolio of platforms and programmings that have a range of timing and probability of, time and probability of impact to patients. And so if we just, speak briefly about each of these. You know, the grants program being that we generally fund early stage research is our is our highest risk programming tends to be preclinical or very early phase clinical. You know, because of that it has the longest time horizon to patient impact, but we think it's it's critical because it sets the foundation for understanding of the disease state and for our other programming. If you look at the consortium, you know, it really sits in the middle here in pipeline creation and because the work that comes into the consortium has largely been vetted it has a really fairly good probability of, of, of having an impact and benefit to patients and probably over that sort of a five to eight year time horizon when you think about research coming in, it's probably in sort of that supporting phase two, phase three um, uh, uh, sort of phase research. And then finally, you know, you take a look at the registry. We, you know, this is research that's directly engaged with patients. We think it's, it's practically assured of having a direct impact on patients. In the present, it can have an impact on patients by connecting them to clinical trials. And then in the long term, in the short or longer term, over the next several years, as we start to develop a longitudinal database, we think it'll be a continuous resource that can have a, a potential benefit and impact on, on, on patients. So these three programs have really clear synergies. I've highlighted some of the natural intersections on this slide. And what I'll do in, in, you know, throughout the talk is give some specific examples of how we see these programs intersecting with each other. And what you'll see us doing is really trying to nudge parties to drive facilitation between these various programs and collaboration. And so think of us as somewhat, you know, you know, mildly aggressive, but quite friendly cross pollinators as we try to drive collaboration across our platforms. And, you know, to wrap up this introduction phase, this, this slide really represents another way to look at this. And that is, you know, the patient need and patients and patient need are really the context and, and why we do research. And so the patients will be, their need will be the context for the research program and prioritization. You know, another way to look at this slide is you have this intersection of these various platforms and that center part where these platforms intersect is the area where we can have maximum patient impact. And so what you'll see us trying to do as we grow these platforms is increase the coordination and increase that overlap in the center to, you know, to really maximize the benefit that our research program can bring to patients. Yeah, you know, I won't talk about it today, but just before I leave, I want to note that we have robust advocacy programming that's ongoing, and that's largely focused on expanding the pot of federal dollars available to support PKD research. And so with that, that provides a good segue 
uh, into the grants program. And so our grants program is largely, you know, it's central to our research within the foundation and it's fundamentally unchanged in the way we're continuing to develop our programming. It'll continue to be annual. It'll continue to be an open solicitation uh, for any research in PKDA with some special areas of interest um, and largely focus on early stage work. Perhaps the only new piece and sort of consistent with this theme of cross-pollination is that as we grow these platforms, we really are gonna look to facilitate collaboration between our grantees and other research program within the foundation where it makes sense. And so I can give you some examples of this on the next slide and I'll give some examples later in the talk. So I went back and analyzed our grantee portfolio back to 2016 with an eye towards research that the foundation has funded that may be relevant to the consortium or relevant to the registry. And so this slide represents us, what I'd call our cohort of biomarkers and drug development grantee, um, drug development uh, grantee cohort. And it's a, it's a really nice cohort. And so if you look at sort of, you know, how we're trying to build out these collaborations, you know, I think Catherine, who was, a, the, the work she talked about in May was, we funded the early stage of that work back in 2016. And that's a really great example from the work that she and Aaron shared of the kinds of projects that would really make sense to go and to come into the consortium, support AR, potential AR drug development and general biomarker development. Tim's another great example. Tim Klein from the Mayo is another great example. I think you're all very familiar with his work around automated image analysis. I'll talk later about how we think some of that work may fit into our registry expansion plans, particularly around an image data and analysis, uh, 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 image and data analysis workflow. And then finally, and this is, this is absolutely co coincidental, in our 2020 cohort, we happen to have four grantees who are working on biomarkers, either imaging or molecular biomarkers, and so what we see is a real potential for collaboration in the future between these grantees and the consortium where we try to bring together that sort of intersection of academic and regulatory science. And so before I end the grant section, I just wanna send a reminder to everybody that pre-application deadline is, is Monday the 17th, so that if you haven't started work on, on your pre-application, it'd be a lovely weekend to spend some time writing and thinking about uh, what you'd like to apply for and sending it to us by Monday afternoon. And just close this with a little gallows humor to explain why we're why we're adopting this pre-application program. And that is that we know putting together full grants and reviewing full grants is a lot of work for both us and as well as for you, for those who apply. And so we see this as a way to increase the efficiency such that if folks, folks that are invited to submit, you know, full grants will have a higher likelihood of funding. And so a lower likelihood that you may end up on this sort of video shelf of horrors. And so with that, um, you know, Wendy, I think we have a chance. I don't see any questions coming up, but if there are any questions related to the grants program or that introduction, we could take them now. Perfect. If you have questions, just remember you're probably muted, so. Ah, good question, Frank. Um, so the pre-applications instructions are on the website. And at this stage, you know, I think the grants program is largely directed towards academic researchers. And we have been having discussions and we'll continue to have discussions of, you know, how that might be if, if it makes sense to open up into um, biopharma. Certainly collaborations between biopharma and academics if the grant was coming through the academic group would make a lot of sense. I see. You know, I'm not seeing any other questions coming up, so I may just uh, I may just move on. So now, what I'd like to do is start talking about talk about the consortium as sort of that second second element of our of our research platforms. And so it was interesting when I was doing my diligence for this job opportunity at the foundation. I read the EMA briefing book on total kidney volume, and I just thought that was a really exceptional piece of of regulatory science. And then, somewhat coincidentally, my first day back on the job at the end of October. I ended up out at, at a CPATH in Tucson meeting, meeting the consortium folks out there. And then very shortly after that was at the consortium open house at ASN and had a chance to meet, you know, many of you are on the line as well as other folks from CPATH. And, and one of the topics of conversation at both of those meetings with, was that this consortium has been wildly successful. It's completed the key objective that Ron and, 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 and his collaborators, you know, established when, when Ron founded this consortium. And so one of the questions that was that was asked and we discussed quite a bit was, you know, should we invest, you know, now the consortium has met its objective, should we 
should we invest a lot of time and energy and and continuing to grow the consortium or should we leave it sort of in its in its current state and you know for the reasons that i'm going to talk about we've chosen the form we think it's really important to continue to drive this consortium forward and invest our time and energy in it and so the main reason is the impact so this slide is the pkd um, new chemical entity sort of therapeutics pipeline and it's really through the work of May, all, all of you here, many of you here on the phone, work of Ron, work of Frank, the work of the consortium and collaborators in bringing total kidney volume forward as a prognostic biomarker and likely serotonin end, endpoint that we have this pipeline. And that's either because total kidney volume is being used directly in these de development programs, but also because, and I don't think we can forget that, the fact that, you know, a regulatory, once a regulatory path has been demonstrated for an area of high unmet need, that's a real pull through to bring other companies to get into the game. And so, you know, I'd say our main reason to want to drive this forward is we see the impact of the success of this work for patients. And then when you take a look, you know, at the, at the you know, hopefully the pipeline to come, you see that, you know, there are a gaggle of preclinical programs that are, that are being developed both within, you know, early stage biotech, mid stage biotech and pharma. And so one of the things we'd like to do through our continued efforts within the consortium is not only continue to support the existing pipeline, but understand how we can help, you know, help bring those programs forward into an expanded pipeline for, for PKD by supporting the development of new drug development tools. And I'd just like to note here that when you look at this pipeline, although we call it the PKD pipeline, it's almost entirely ADPK weighted. There's some early work in ARPKD, and so one of the things from the foundation's perspective that's important to bring to the consortium is also a focus on ARPKD because we believe that we believe that um, working through the consortium may be a way to help catalyze that pipeline around um, around AR. So, and we recognize though that this isn't easy. So, I, I spent you know the large part of my career in drug discovery and pharmaceutical development, and, and PKD, whether it be AR. PKD or ADPKD are objectively difficult indications for a number of intrinsic factors, some of which I'd like to talk about here because I think it helps frame sort of the conversation of where we, some of how we might be thinking around the consortium. And so one for both of these is slow disease progression. And so that from a clinical development perspective creates a need to enroll patients with a high likelihood of meeting endpoints in a realistic time frame, And that necessitates the development of fairly sophisticated models to enrich for patient selection and clinical trials um, requires a good amount of work, requires a good amount of data, and certainly is is a is a is a challenge in the development of new therapies. Another is the regulatory endpoints, which I think this consortium has dealt with quite well. You know, the traditional kidney and liver endpoints really narrow the window for therapeutic intervention, and that drives a need for creative thinking around biomarkers as well as surrogate endpoints to support therapeutic development. Again, an area where there's been success for AD, but not really work yet on ARPKD. And then when you pull these two together, it, you know, from a patient perspective, it has a real impact on timing of intervention. You know, from a pragmatic perspective, um, using these tools, it means that intervention is weighted towards intervening latent disease. Um, you know, from the patient perspective, that limits the potential impact on the patient because the disease has progressed quite substantially before, before treatments are available or enrollment in clinical trials are available. And so we're looking for regulatory approaches and tools to pull these interventions earlier into the disease progression. And as I mentioned, fortunately for ADPKD, there's been there's been a lot of successful work addressing these challenges, and that's why we have a pipeline today. Um, as I'll talk about in the next few slides, I think there's continued work to do there. We could do there. Certainly, a lot of work to do there for ARPKD. And just you know, I think the call to action here is that for these sort of chronic, progressive, and rare diseases, there's really a need for continued regulatory science to facilitate the development of therapies to the greater benefit of the patient population. And so just because there's challenges doesn't mean, you know, from a therapeutic perspective that we have some wishes. And so I want to share some of what we're thinking about at the foundation from a therapeutic perspective on this slide. And so from the AD perspective, you know, you probably heard it loud and clear on the last slide, but it's really therapies for use earlier in disease. You know, the earlier that we can bring interventions to patients, I think the greater opportunity there is, there is to reduce the likelihood that they'll progress to end stage renal disease. And so that's important uh, to us. You know, further on, you know, I think broadening the drug mechanisms is important, I'd say for a couple of reasons. One, given the complexity underlying PKD, it's likely to be a disease that's treated with a polypharmacy. And then secondarily, with the extra renal manifestations, 
it may be that that some mechanisms may have a better uh, likelihood of impacting extra renal manifestations than others. So we see a real need to broaden mechanisms, which is happening in the existing pipeline. And then finally, you know, what we'd like to see is pathobiology directed therapies, therapies that that get to the get to the meat of the problem around polycysteine pathway disruption. Because again, we think addressing the disease at its at its sort of biologic base may have a better likelihood of systemic benefit. So that's our thinking around AD. You know, on ARPKD, we're really looking for, you know, hope to see any disease specific and modifying therapies brought forward. And so from these, you know, from these um, pipeline wishes come thoughts about drug development tools. And so in the next slide, I want to share our thoughts there. Just want to start with, you know, the safe harbor warning and that we recognize that, um, you know, the current drug development projects out there may not be as advanced as total kidney volume was when the consortium was formed around it. And that's totally okay. You know, if, if you look at the way CPATH has built other consortiums, they can accept early phase sort of discovery phase projects, and they can accept projects that are regulatory ready to move forward for qualification. And so as we go through our thinking about this reconsortium process, we're open-minded to projects that fall in that, that full gamut. And so with that being said, again, I wanna share our thoughts around uh, ADPKD and then ARPKD drug development tool needs. And so if you take, you know, the primary goal of getting earlier interventions for ADPKD, that, create, that creates a need for a, whole, for a whole suite of drug development tools from endpoints to biomarkers to quantitative models. And so certainly that, that we hope is a, can be a priority of the consortium. When you think about growing that pipeline, you know, there's a couple other needs there. And again, this gets to this point that our interest is not only in regulatory tools or regulatory advanced tools, but also tools that can help advance early clinical programs things that can be used as guideposts and reasons to believe so that folks can champion the development of, of products for ADPKD, new therapies for AD, ADPKD. So I think of that, I think of things like general pharmacodynamic markers. You know, Tolvaptin was incredibly fortunate to have urine osmolality as a pharmacodynamic biomarker. That's a that's a awesome, fairly, fairly convenient and great pharmacodynamic biomarker to have. When we think about other mechanisms, you know, the question that comes to mind is, are there things out there for the kidney that are the equivalent of, say, a troponin or CKMB spill for cardiac for cardiac disease, where there'd be a way to see if a if a drug is 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 uh, slowing the progression of the disease in early phase you know early phase two clinical trials to give a reason to believe, or are there you know in line with wanting therapies that are polycysteine directed, are there specific markers of polycysteine function that could be used again as a reason to believe that that the therapeutic is modifying the biology of the disease early in clinical development to provide that strong rationale that's needed to pull products through into later phase clinical development. So those are our thinking at present around ADPKD. You know, around ARPKD, um, you just don't mean to be facetious on this bullet, we've seen from the presentations that have come into the, come into the consortium over the last several months that there's some really great work in ARPKD that could lead to the you know, development of drug development tools. And so what we'd like to see is you know, use the consortium as that interface to bring that science into the regulatory science perspective to engage with regulators and start to understand what are the benchmarks for these um, for these tools to to be developed to help support an ARPKD pipeline. So that's really the why and the what. So now I want to do in the last couple of slides in this section is move on to the how. And so I say, you know, it's a good collaboration when you take, you know, your colleague slides. And so the next few slides I borrowed from John Michael. And that is just to say that, you know, the CPATH has a pre-consortium model that they use when forming new consortia. It's been quite successful. It provides mechanisms to really systematically assess needs and opportunities and then create a landscape and a roadmap to set objectives for developing the drug development tools that will pull those medical areas forward. And so we want to engage in this process and we're using the term reconsortium just to recognize, hey, we already exist as a consortium, so we don't need a pre-consortium, but we needed this phase as a reconsortium. And so that first phase of this is this landscape analysis. Um, and there's a couple of ways that you can go about a landscape analysis. One is to allow it organically, to allow the community to sort of bubble up projects. And we have some great examples of that that Wendy shared. You know, there's the, the Santa Fe modeling project is a good example of that. I think the work um, that Alan, you and his colleagues are, are, are considering have initiated around modernization of CETUS terminology is another great example of that. Um, but really in order to jumpstart this, we'd like to see a directed approach, and that is to engage directly with our stakeholders, the healthcare authorities, industry and academic researchers and patients to identify needs um, and hunt for opportunities for collaboration to help develop this landscape. And so that hunting ground could be, as I mentioned, it could be our grantees, 
we think there's a lot of interesting industry projects that are probably out there going along. You know, the new NIH PKD centers have a biomarker focus, could be there, could be from the regulators. And so, you know, takeaway is we want to do a really directed landscape analysis. This next slide shares some of the process that CPATH has used in the past. This is an example from a biomarker consortium. Um, so a fairly rigorous process. And what I can say is when I was doing my diligence around how the foundation should view the consortium and what we should engage in, John Michael and CPAP colleagues were kind enough to share with me the work product from this efforts and other consortium. So what I can, you know, at least share with all of you is that I found that to be really robust, thorough, and, and I'd say fun process. And I think if we engage in this, it can lead us really to a clear set of data around which we can set our priorities set clear objectives for forming, you know, the next set of goals for this consortium going forward. And so just to summarize this section before I take questions, you know, what I hope you hear is that the foundation has a really strong conviction to support and grow the consortium. We also feel very strongly that it's important to broaden this consortium to include ARPKD PKD needs because we think this is a great area to catalyze pipeline development uh, for those patients. And then finally, that you know we've done our diligence around this and that we're really bought into the reconsortium process and so with that um probably have maybe a minute or so if, if there's any questions at this point around the consortium hey chris this is close that thanks for that presentation that was great um i i cannot agree with you more that uh that uh the reconsortium stage is is uh turning out to be quite exciting and, and uh that landscape analysis of the of the unmet needs is is critically mm -hmm. important, yep. and uh, for that we need uh, we we need the strong uh, contributions from our colleagues from industry mm -hmm. in helping us identify the the areas of unmet need in both the dominant form and the recessive form of the disease, so that we can tailor that with everything else that that we do at CPAP as it was outlined on the slide, uh, which is the standard process that that we follow for pretty much every single effort that we do. Mm -hmm. Identifying also what kinds of data needs we we would have yeah. uh, to generate the the proper solutions, and and then mm -hmm. go after those those data sets with the addition of the of the efficiency that that brings the 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 rare disease uh, accelerator data platform that that we have that uh, mm -hmm. it takes takes away a lot of the headaches of the of the data uh, acquisition yeah. and management components. So yeah, this is exciting. Great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Klaus. And I, I do appreciate the shout out for, for this large collaboration. And so um, thank you much. And I think just from a time perspective, I want to move on now to talking about the last platform, you know, in our program, and that is the registry. And so I'm going to talk about the registry in two parts. I'm going to talk about the registry as it exists today, and then I'm going to talk about the registry as we'd like to see it grow into the future. And so before I get into the registry today piece, what I want to do is recognize that you know, the work I'm about to talk about, this has all happened before I came to the foundation. So I want to give a real shout out to the Registry Implementation Advisory Group, you know, in particular, David Barron, along with Elise, who were instrumental in initiating and building this registry. And so you just want to share the next bit really is, is on the work that preceded me, and we're really um, excited to share it today. So if you look at the registry as it was constructed, or as it is constructed, it's really built to be a national online longitudinal patient reported outcomes database. And as they were building it, there were really three primary goals. One is to capture outcomes important to patients. The second is to connect patients to clinical studies. And the third was in that initial construction to really lay the foundation for its expansion as a broad outcomes research tool. Um, I think what's really exciting is if you look at the heat map on the right, this is an enrollment heat map. And you can see that this is truly a national registry. The registrants, you know, the density of our registration really does reflect the population density in the United States. And I think what's really interesting is one of the questions that's asked is where patients are being seen. And so if you look at the data from that question, the patients who have enrolled in this registry come from hundreds of clinical sites throughout the United States. And so I think it really demonstrates that this registry has broad reach into the national PKD community. This slide's a snapshot of the current status of the registry. And I think the, you know, the registry is about three weeks from its first birthday. And so we've had great uptake. We have over 17 uh, patients have signed up to participate in the registry. When you look at engagement, the metric for engagement is, is I think, really excellent. Almost 70% of the patients who have signed up have completed the available modules. And for a registry of this methodology, that's a, that's a really high level of participation. So we're, we're really encouraged by that. And of course, we're going to continue to seek engagement. Um, we have, we have uh, 53 clinics currently in our clinical database that serve in one way to inform patients. 
And one of the other things that I think we're really happy about is we've established a really great advisory group to help us think through and grow this registry. This slide just shows you how the registry works. Basically, patients enter via a secure online portal, they complete a core questionnaire, and that allows them to access additional patient reported outcome modules. The cadence of data collection of these modules varies based upon the nature of the data being collected. Some of these modules are on a 12 month or annual cadence, some are on a quarterly or every three month cadence. And that's, that cadence is developed as we, as we initiate and develop these modules in terms of how frequently do we need to collect data to really collect the data that, um, that's necessary. So when you look about what we're collecting, that's on this slide. Um, we have five current uh, uh, modules that are active. We have a core questionnaire that covers demographics, detailed demographics, history, and disease status. We have a family history that's kind of obvious, but it is a fairly robust and large family history given the nature of ADP, KD, and families. And a diet and lifestyle questionnaire whose focus is on nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle patterns. And those were really, those were the three modules that launched the registry. More recently, we've added two validated quality of life modules, the impact scale and the pain and discomfort scale. And so between these five modules, uh, we're collecting a you know, really fulsome and I think uh, a fairly detailed data set on how patients are experiencing the disease. So if you look at baseline findings, so the data on this slide is baseline findings from, from almost 1200 patients. So if you look at diagnosis, you know, the majority of people, vast majority have been diagnosed by imaging with the majority of those having been diagnosed by ultrasound. A minority of patients report having had a genetic test as part of their diagnostic workup. If you look at the population from the perspective of kidney status, you about 75% are pre-kidney failure. And I think importantly, when you think about the use of the registry for clinical trial recruitment, almost 60% of patients have reported an EGFR that's consistent with particip participation in clinical studies. So I think we're building a good set of patients for trial participation in this registry. A minority of patients are on dialysis, and we have a pretty sizable post-transplant um, cohort as well. And then just from quick baseline findings around comorbidities, these are the top five self-reported uh, comorbidities in the enrolled population. So not a lot of surprises here. And then last thing here, just we got some exciting news today. So we'll be presenting an abstract uh, on this on the registry at ASN this fall, so we'll be able to give a you know a lot more detailed update on on the methodology and what we've learned at ASN. And so just to wrap up this section, um, you know we in collaboration with our steering committee continue to grow the patient the this this patient reported outcomes and that steering committee is composed of our patient registry advisory committee co-chaired by Ron and Terry Wanick also has a patient working group associated with it. And so at present, we have four modules that are, that, are, that are in the process of being developed and or nearly launched. Two of them are research focused, the liver cyst module and a vascular outcomes module. We have one dedicated to covering the, capturing the COVID impact on patients with ADPKD. Given the nature of our methodology here, that's really centered on social and economic burden of COVID on the ADPKD population. And then we have a, the final module that's in the works is one to support and frame future advocacy efforts. And that's focused around healthcare, uh, healthcare utilization. So now what I'd like to do at the end is, is really focus on um, registry expansion. So I stated at the outset of this talk that, that one of our long-term objectives is to grow the registry into a really powerful tool for outcomes research for patients with ADPKD. Um, now I'd like to share our thinking around it. And so this is a, you know, it's a pretty broad landscape to get to. And for me, I need, I need structure around my thinking. So just want to share on this slide sort of structurally how we're thinking about this expansion. So this is a, um, this, this is a model that, that are showing here is a, is a platform business model that one of our board members shared with me. And I, you know, I find it really apt construct um, to help guide our thinking. And it's basics, what it recognizes is that the most impactful platforms pull the ecosystem of builders, suppliers, and users together around a common theme and a common need. And so when you think about in the context of our registry, um, it's pretty basic. You start with the most important piece and that are the patients. Patients are the suppliers of the data. So when you think about what type of data to collect, it needs to somehow have the potential to have an impact on patients. Move along to the, to the next piece, which is really you know, the research community, both industry and academic. You're the users of this, you know, the users of this database. And so you need to be collecting data that is meaningful to you and the questions you're going to ask both in the present and in the future. And then we at the foundation as the builders really need to keep our eye on data that's the greatest utility that can serve the needs of the suppliers and the users. 
And so as we've gone through using this construct, we've had a number of conversations. And I think some of the ones that have been really interesting have been those with patients who have a lot of experience in rare disease. And they've highlighted that, you know, PKD, ADPKD is unusual for rare disease and that diagnosis is fairly straightforward, but prognosis is very difficult. And so that's led us, you know, really with the, with the insight of others to think about the prognostic gap for ADPKD patients as the sort of umbrella or context to guide the prioritization of data collection as we expand the registry. So what do we mean by the prognostic gap? Well, I think, you know, you're all quite familiar with this graphic and basically what it says is that ADPKD is an insidious disease. If you look at it from the perspective of kidney function, the disease advances silently with progressive tissue destruction in the face of apparently normal kidney function. And although for you know, those of you at the academic settings, you, you are frequently providing patients a really comprehensive workup and providing them information about their prognostic status, many patients don't have access to the type of image acquisition and analysis and other types of data collection that's needed to provide a risk classification and prognosis. And so there's a large number of, of our patient population that for, you know, possibly for several decades are sitting with this prognostic gap of not understanding their disease status until their kidney function starts to wane. And so we think that filling this prognostic gap could be really impactful to patients for several reasons. One is, you know, understanding where they're at in their disease will certainly help, you know, um, may inform their disease modifying behaviors. We think obviously when you arm patients with knowledge, they can better advocate for their care. And then finally, and talk a little bit more about this, that it can add access to therapy. So one of the things that's that's happening, I think many of you are aware of it, and that insurers are in part using clinical trial, clinical trial criteria to determine um, coverage for disease modifying therapies that are currently available. And you know, we look at it given that many of the trials that are that are ongoing are using similar enrollment criteria, we don't see this changing. And so we see the opportunity to provide risk classification to patients is a great way to provide them some of the information they may need to help them gain access to therapy. And I'd say that, you know, the, this concept came from early discussions. Over the last several months, Elise and I have been conducting research around the Centers of Excellence program and registry expansion. And I think from that, a couple things have become really clear. One is that the prognostic gap is, is real for our patients. And then secondarily, that the registry may be a really good tool to help, help close this prognostic gap. And so as we think about Closing that prognostic gap, I um, want to talk a little bit about what kind of data we collect. And so I think we're all in general agreement that risk, risk stratification and prognosis is really accomplished by quantitative measures of imaging data, total kidney volume and other cystic indexes, combined with lab data, medical history, et cetera, and that genetics can also play an important role in that process. And so those considerations are really driving our data expansion, which I don't think is gonna be a surprise to anybody. Certainly, we wanna expand into collection of EHR data, number of reasons, you know, having, having medical record data will help verify the patient reported data, provides for some interesting comparisons potentially with patient reported data, increased granularity should aid in clinical trial recruitment. But I think most importantly from that prognosis perspective, this kind of data is necessary to fill into risk score classifications and prognostic models to have the kind of benefits in filling that prognostic gap that we're talking about. You know, not surprisingly, you know, image data is also an important part of our expansion plans. The benefits of collecting of imaging data, I think, are very similar to the EHR data. And it's really the combination of these two data sets that's necessary to provide total kidney volume and Mayo risk classifications to patients. And so when we think about our prioritization, you know, in the present, it's these two that are probably the most critical parameters for us to expand to. And we're going to prioritize our expansion around these two types of data sets. That being said, you know, there's strong interest. We have a strong interest in collection of genetic data. It's obviously necessary for pro PKD uh, calculations. I think that work that Peter and his colleagues shared last week shows how genetic data can be used in combination with imaging to refine prognoses. So we see it important for that reason. And then. I think finally, you know, genetic data is really critical to a better understanding of disease, and I think will be necessary in the future to support targeted therapies. So again, um, you know, uh, that was the that was the what, the why, and the what, and now a little bit of the how. And so, <laughs> I think if if folks could go on mute. Yeah, please put your phones on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sorry, Chris. 
<laughs> no, no, it's good. It's just, uh, it's like, it's probably like being a pilot, all the, the you hear this stuff in the background. Um, <laughs> I, so I mentioned, I mentioned in passing that Elisa and I in concert with our leadership team and, and consults have engaged in diligence around to guide the establishment of PKD centers of excellence. And so we anticipate using this sort of well-established <clears throat> centers model connected to a registry in part to facilitate data collection. So look for us moving in this direction going forward. And so the next few slides, I wanna share some thinking as to what this could look like. And I just wanna recognize, we recognize this is a complex build. So one of the things we're doing is we're gonna be in short order engaging with consultants with expertise in, in building out registries connected to centers of excellence to help guide us in the data collection strategy and, and help guide us in the, in, the, in the construction of databases with the appropriate architecture for data usability. And so while the concepts I'm gonna share in the next couple slides I think are solid, they're subject to change based upon the findings of that, uh, of that effort. And so just from a data collection flow, we wanna integrate the future data collection into the patient, into the patient portal. We wanna do that for several reasons. One is that you know, we wanna maintain patient centricity. That's important to us and that's important to our patient community. We think that this flow will help potentially drive participation of patients in the registry. And then finally, um, we think this flow is, as outlined here will help enrich our patients with complete cohorts. And so in terms of you know, thinking about EHR and imaging data, I'll just talk to those on the next couple slides. So this is a high level of, uh, outline of how we're thinking about EHR data collection. It's gonna be a multi-step process moving from manual chart extraction to a semi-automated approach to very likely an automated approach. Can assure you that it's gonna be benchmarked with specific data being collected along the way to drive decision-making. And our goal here is really to achieve a scalable system and that'll be based on both you know, patient factors as well as how the clinics that see these patients operate. And so what I wanna assure you is that this won't be done in a vacuum, but it'll be done based upon earned experience and the data we collect along the way in pilot projects. So when we look at image, image data, you know, how we're thinking about generating an image data collection analysis workflow is shown on this slide. One of the things that we've heard in talking to patients is that they have a lot of comfort sharing this type of very sensitive information when they participate in randomized clinical trials. And so we wanna use a, 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 you know, a, an RCT-like process for data collection. And that necessitates, necessitates a few things. One is that we build an image processing um, functionality into this, into this workflow for a few reasons, to de-identify data, to QC images before sending them along to a central reader. And thirdly, to serve as an image repository so that we have a repository of these images for future use. Um, we think it's critical that this have a central reader function for, for at least two reasons. One is, you know, from the research perspective, having all the data analyzed in a coherent fashion is, I think, is necessary for the usability of this data. And I think importantly, from a patient perspective, when we go back to that prognostic gap, many patients aren't able to get the kind of sophisticated quantitative workup of their images that are provided, at, you know, by those of you who work in academic medical centers. And so we see a central reader as a critical piece of this puzzle. Um, we've been in discussions, I mentioned Tim earlier, we've been in discussions with Tim and his group at the Mayo and thinking about how some of their tools could serve as central reader function. I think there's a lot of potential there uh, for engagement around that. And then finally, we need a really well-established and compliant process to provide this information back to the patient. So we're in the process of thinking through um, all of these things. And so just to wrap up this section, you know, hopefully the, the benefits I think are fairly obvious, but I'll, but I'll highlight them nonetheless. You know, from the patient perspective, we think the benefit of this expansion is really threefold. It can provide them an individualized understanding of their current disease, you know, a prognosis of where they might be going in the future. And again, importantly, to potentially provide data to support access to therapy. You know, from the researcher perspective, from the user perspective, what we hope to do by accomplished by doing this is to provide for you a really large and longitudinal data set for outcomes research. And importantly, as part of that, an image data repository that's linked to key, clinic, key clinical data, as well as patient reported outcome data for future research use. And so just to summarize uh, before taking any, any last questions, you know, again, a shout out to the, to the group that started this registry the first year. I think when you look at the enrollment, um, you look at the enrollment, you look at the data generated, you look at the engagement, you look at the fact that we're gonna present an abstract on it. The first year has been a great success. Uh, you know, what I hope you've seen and what I've shared with you around our thinking and that we, is we have a really solid, you know, intellectual construct and framework for expansion of the data collection. 
and really in a way that will benefit both the patients and the research community, which is the foundation of really our core constituencies. Um, you know, I really wish that I could sit here and, and uh, tell you exactly when we are going to be able to do this. Um, I can't as I sit here today, but what I can assure you is that we're going to continue with diligence and operational planning, and we'll be targeting an initial pilot project focused around EHR and image data collection to, uh, to kick this effort off. And so just to wrap up uh, before questions, I just want to throw up this acknowledgement slide and thank the folks who have been supporting us at the foundation. You know, from my perspective, I really want to particularly thank Elise. She's been a great, she has a great colleague to work with. And then also really thank our advisory committees, our stakeholder advisory committee, our patient, you know, registry patient advisory group, and then our key scientific advisory committee that supports all our efforts. And in particular, our patient registry advisory committee that supports um, our registry um, in, in, in a number of ways. And so, you know, thank you very much. And um, it looks like we have time for questions. So I'd love to, I haven't been paying attention to the chat, so I'd love to hear what <laughs> folks have, have going on. There's a, there's a few questions, uh, Chris. The first one is uh, from Pravin. Yeah. And if he's asking, if you have demographic summary. Um, I don't know if you see it on the. I, I missed it. Um, yeah, okay, so. Uh, yeah, so demographic summary. So yeah, that's an area that we're currently working on, Pravin, if you mean. So right now our demographics, I think, are overweighted towards participation of, of women and they're over part, overrepresented in terms of participation of, 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 um, of, uh, of, of folks who are Caucasian. And so one of the efforts that we have ongoing uh, within the foundation are ways to increase the diversity of that enrollment. Let's scroll through. Well, wow, there's a lot of things going on here in the chat. I know, Wendy, could you help me uh, maybe organize yeah. oh, what yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. And then this, the next one is uh, from Frank. And so he was asking, uh, knowing that CPATH is working with NORB on their rare disease registries, are you considering adding, adding additional clinical EHR or genomic PKD specific or WGS, WES data to the AD PKD registry or working together? Uh, so, uh, working, yep. no, that's a, that's a great question, Frank. I think, you know, it's kind of funny. I was I, I was assuming you'd be asking this question potentially. I'd say that, you know, at present what we're doing, think think of us as someone who's, you know, maybe not quite ready for a relationship. We're working on getting, you know, understanding ourselves, what our values are and what we need to build in the registry. And I think once we have a better understanding of how we want to build it out, then it'll be time for us to be thinking about long-term collaborations. You know, as, as we think about what those long-term collaborations could look like, the thing that we always keep centered in our focus is that we need to make sure that we're serving the patients well um, and maintaining, you know, that aspect of our registers. So I think the, you know, not much of an answer to your question, except it's on our radar. And what we really need at present is, is I think, the space to build out the registry in the way we see it for the patient perspective. And once that's done, consider what those collaborations could look like. Yeah, 